Good morning, brothers and sisters, and a warm welcome to all guests and visitors worshiping with us on this day as we commemorate the suffering and death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Council has only the one announcement that our offerings today are for Mission Aid Brazil. So far, the announcements let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us sing in praise of our God from hymn 27, stanzas 1, 2, 5, and 6. Let us now together with the church of all times and places make profession of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith as we find it summarized in the Apostles' Creed as set to music in hymn 2.
Let us bow our hearts before God in prayer and seek his blessing over our worship today. Let us pray. Lord God and Father in heaven, you are worthy of all praise and honor and worship. For you are eternally great and most glorious. We exalt you for your greatness and your glory, particularly as you have revealed it to us in your gracious work through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Lord, we thank you for sending us your Son, for sending your Son into this world, not to condemn the world, but that through him this world would be saved. We thank you for his life, for his teaching, for his miracles. But above all, we thank you that he came to humble himself unto death. For this we know, O Lord, that what happened there at Golgotha 2,000 years ago was the centerpiece of human history where your divine will to save lost sinners was accomplished once and for all through the sacrifice offered by Jesus Christ. Lord, we give you thanks and honor and blessing to the Lamb who was slain. And we pray that you will fill our hearts with a profound sense of thankfulness and joy as we realize that he was there as our substitute hanging upon our cross, suffering our curse, bearing our condemnation, and being utterly forsaken, all so that we could find grace, the grace of atonement, the grace of forgiveness, the grace of acceptance and fellowship, which if we had been left to ourselves would have remained ever elusive, never possible, and we would have been forever lost and without hope in this dark world. So Lord, we pray that our worship today would be truly acceptable in your sight. We pray that in this time of worship, we may be so renewed in our faith that we would know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. For this is the good news that all of us so desperately need to hear and to believe. And so we pray that with your word in our hearts, we may glory in the cross and find comfort in the suffering and death of our Savior. So Lord, we pray that you will bless us and lead us through the power of your word and by the grace of your Spirit, so that we may be led to the Lord of the word, the living word, the dying Savior to see again your glorious grace through him who conquered death through his death, so that our sin and its penalty and power could be removed. So, O oh Lord, teach us and transform us this morning by the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is proclaimed here or wherever you have opened up the mouths of your servants to proclaim it on this day. And give us all open ears and open hearts to receive it as you would have us receive it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us again join our hearts in song by singing from Psalm 22, stanzas 1, 3, and 6. Psalm 22, let us sing these words realizing these were words that Jesus Christ took upon his lips as he suffered and died on the cross.
I invite you now to turn with me in Holy Scripture to our Scripture reading that is found in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. Let us read together from verse 32 through to verse 66, the end of the chapter. Matthew 27, verse 32 through 66. And our text is found in the heart of our passage regarding the crucifixion and death of Jesus. Within the heart of that section in verses 47 to 49. Hear now God's holy and inspired word beginning at Matthew 27 verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross, that is the cross of Christ. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those Standing there, this is our text, heard this, they said, He is calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of of Zebedee's sons. So far, our scripture reading, our text, as was mentioned, is found in verses 47 to 49. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He is calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. 
So far, our reading of God's word this morning, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. After the proclamation of God's word, let us respond in song by singing from hymn 23, the 23rd hymn, All Stanzas. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, being as it is Good Friday, we've come together not as we regularly do on a Sunday, but this time on a weekday to pause and reflect and focus our attention on the death of Jesus Christ, God's saving sacrifice for our sins. For this, after all, is the very heart of our Christian faith and the very heart of the Gospel. And the four Gospels that we have in our Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all confirm this for us. It has been well said that the Gospels are not biographies about our Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, they are passion narratives with ex. Extended introductions. You only have to do the math to see that that is true. For we can very quickly and easily discover that three of the four Gospel writers spend about a, a third of their Gospels detailing for us one single week of Jesus' life. And in the fourth Gospel, virtually half of the Gospel is devoted to the last week of Jesus' life, and most of that concentrated upon the final 24 hours. This tells us, this should tell us, that Christ lived to die, our souls to save. And so as Christians gathered here, we are well aware that when we come to the story of the crucifixion, we know we come to the very center of our faith the center of human history, the very heart of the meaning of human existence and divine purpose. And this reality has been captured quite accurately by that old spiritual song that began with the question, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? When we give deep thought to that question, we understand that that is not an intellectual question, but one that, that goes right down to the hearts of those who are asking it. Have you really thought about what happened there at the cross? Have you really contemplated it and let it sink in? What it would have been like to be there and to witness it happen, would you have understood its significance? The chorus of this song goes to say, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Does Christ's crucifixion cause you to tremble? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? So let us consider our posture before the foot of the cross as we listen to God's Word proclaimed to us this morning under this theme. Matthew draws our attention to the bystanders at Christ's crucifixion. We'll consider first what they witnessed and secondly how they responded. What the bystanders witnessed. Of course, we know that Christ was not crucified in secret in some out-of-the-way place. The Romans crucified criminals in places where the public eye could see them so that they would all be warned, this is what you get when you mess with Rome, when you disturb the peace of the empire. Live and learn from these examples. And so it is no surprise that the Scriptures reveal that there were people there at Christ's crucifixion. Numbers of people, actually. And quite a variety of different groups as well. For instance, there were the soldiers. 
The soldiers were there doing their duty with great indifference as to how it affected anyone. They had hauled Jesus around from place to place. They had stripped him, crucified him, gambled for his clothes and personal belongings. They posted watch over him so that no one would try to rescue him. Their actions reveal their attitude that they didn't care what happened to him. They had a job to execute and execute their job they did. But there were others there as well, weren't there? We read of the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders of the people who were there to mock him, to mock Christ, to ridicule him, to hurl their insults at him. They were not indifferent to Christ. They were filled with hatred and animosity and intense disdain for him. But then there were the people who loved him, who believed in him, the women who had followed him throughout the course of his public ministry, provided for him, served him, cared for his needs, standing there to witness this horrible event and still believe in him. Well, that's a pretty good cross-section of reactions of people to our Savior right down to this day. Just as at the literal foot of the cross, to anyone who considers the cross today, these reactions capture the most common responses to the death of Jesus Christ. Indifference, no interest whatsoever, hateful rejection and opposition, and belief. But there was yet a fourth group here at the foot of the cross who might be easy to ignore, easy to bypass. It's the people we find mentioned here in verses 47, 48, and 49. The bystanders. They weren't there to work the way the soldiers were. They weren't there to make sure that the crucifixion gets done and over with the way that the leaders of the Jewish people were there to see. And they weren't there because they loved Jesus either, as the women were. They're just standing around for no other reason than that public crucifixions would attract onlookers and spectators. In those days, there was no television, there were no movie theaters, there was nothing to watch. Nothing like a good execution. So crowds would gather for an execution. That seems to characterize these bystanders, just standing around. Yet, isn't it intriguing, isn't it interesting to see where Matthew places them in our text? He places them right between the great cry of Jesus, the cry of being abandoned by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the death of Jesus when he gave up his spirit. Matthew places these people right between two loud cries that Jesus makes on the cross. If Matthew was a videographer, if he was filming a video here, we'd say he's, he's panning out the frame of his picture from being zoomed in on Christ during his dying moments, now zooming out to, to focus the attention upon the crowd for a minute. He does this by making reference to these bystanders. Why? What? are they meant to teach us? For imagine for a moment, and I'm not recommending this, what if you left out verses 47 to 49 out of your Bible? Just skipped over them. You, you 
probably wouldn't miss them unless you were so familiar with this account that you would. Surely Matthew wasn't putting anything in his gospel that doesn't serve a purpose or a significance of some kind. So what does the Holy Spirit through Matthew mean to teach us here? Well, first, let's consider what these bystanders had seen and witnessed there at the cross that day. Depending on how long they had been present, of course, they would have seen Christ being fixed to the cross with nails being pounded into his hands and feet. And they would have seen him be hoisted up off the ground vertically, attached to this pole. And then the pole would, would be dropped into a hole where it would be left to stand on its own. Well, then they would have seen a lot of agonizing pain. And then they would have witnessed the passers-by who had come to bring their taunts and their mockery for Jesus. Come down if you are the Son of God. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. With those around him, all of them around him, heaping their insults upon him. And then in verse 45, Matthew describes an eerie darkness that, that came over all the land. Something certainly unusual at midday. And it lasted from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which translates to noon to three o'clock in the afternoon, as we would say. And we see here that of interest to Matthew was not the scientific causes or the scientific explanation of this event, of this darkness, but rather the timing of it. The timing revealed that this darkness was no accident. It was no coincidence. This was supernatural. It was as if God, through nature, through creation, was proclaiming the significance of what was happening at that very moment in time. And only a short time later, creation would again declare the significance of what was happening as an earthquake would, would shake the ground, causing the rocks to split apart and tombs to break open. Well, how much of this could be seen and noticed by the bystanders is, of course, a bit of an open question. But certainly the onlookers would have seen signals here that this was no ordinary death. So there Christ hung in the darkness, beaten, bruised, and bloody, convulsing, and unable to breathe freely any longer. He was dying not from the wounds that he had suffered, but from asphyxiation. No doubt, breathing heavily, gasping for every remaining breath. And then coming to the end of the period of darkness, Matthew tells us that Jesus cried out those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words of Psalm 22, words we sang from moments ago. Now this was not a cry of Jesus abandoning his trust in God, by no means. It was an expression of the fact of being forsaken by God. For at this time, he could no longer experience the presence of God's love, but only the presence of God's wrath. And so the darkness, coupled with this cry, can serve to remind us of something, to remind us of the words of Christ, which he spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, saying that God causes the sun to rise upon the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Those were words which spoke of God's 
common goodness toward all mankind. But here, there was no more sun. The sunlight was completely blocked out. We get a sense then here of the infinite separation that took place between Christ and God the Father. The light of the world was forsaken in utter darkness. But what really drew the attention of the bystanders were the, the Aramaic words they heard Jesus utter. Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. And they interpret it by saying, He's calling Elijah. And one of them ran and, and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and, and offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. It's kind of a curious response, isn't it? What's going on here? Well, we'll consider that further as we come now to our second point. Well, we can maybe get into the minds of these bystanders and help us understand more about the death of Jesus Christ if we give thought to what the bystanders believed Jesus said, what they believed Jesus needed, and what they believed Jesus was doing. The first thing we notice is that although we are told in verse 46 already that that Jesus cried out these words in a loud voice. Yet, what we notice is that these bystanders did not hear Jesus correctly. We don't know why exactly that was. Maybe they weren't paying attention. Does that ever happen to you? Something was said perfectly clearly but you weren't paying attention. Parents occasionally have that problem with children and also teachers with their students. But perhaps Jesus, in his agony, did not articulate very clearly. Well, it seems that the point Matthew is making is that they missed the point. They didn't hear what Jesus was saying, not because they were not listening at all, the way the soldiers were just busy doing their job without bothering to pay close attention, or the way that the leaders of Israel were, were hearing him and, and hating him and fuming all the more, or because they were hearing and believing the way that, that the women did who were there. But these other bystanders just heard something, but they didn't get it. They cannot process it. They don't understand it. They think Eloi means Elijah. And so they show themselves to be people who have some acquaintance with the Jewish religion and their scriptures. We can, we can presume, presume then that they are Jews since they know something about Elijah. They knew his name. And they presumably knew something about what the scriptures said about Elijah. They seemed to know that there was a popular expectation that Elijah would be coming back soon. For as you may remember, at the very end of the prophecy of Malachi, the final book in the Old Testament, the last certain prophetic word that was given to Israel, that Israel heard before John the Baptist came, was that God would send Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. So Israel had remembered that. And they had been asking the question, wondering, when is Elijah coming? And maybe you are aware that even to this day, it is still a custom in the homes of pious Orthodox Jews to celebrate the Passover with an open door and an empty seat for Elijah. Table settings ready for him with an extra cup 
filled with wine sitting there, all prepared for Elijah to come and grace the home with his presence. And so maybe we aren't surprised that these bystanders knew enough about Jewish history and Jewish hopes and expectations that they're asking themselves, is he calling Elijah? Will Elijah come? Now this isn't the first time that Matthew's Gospel speaks of Elijah. In chapter 11, Jesus equates John the Baptist with Elijah. And then in, in chapter 16, when Jesus' disciples, uh, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? They say, some say Elijah. So you see there that there was this expectation out there. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration in chapter 17, what happened then? Elijah literally came. He had figuratively come in John the Baptist, but now he literally came. In John the Baptist, as it were, Elijah came to, to warn the people to repent, to turn away from their sins. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah came to comfort Jesus Christ as he faced his death. And so what are we to think then of these people as they think that Jesus is calling for Elijah? Is it a good thing? Well, it is a good thing that they are giving thought to what the scriptures had prophesied. But they were missing the point. For Jesus had said that Elijah already has come. And now with Jesus quoting Psalm 22, they were missing the point again here. Here too, that, that this was a sign of God abandoning His Son with no one coming to help Him. Not Elijah, not angels, not even God Himself would rescue Him. You see, these people knew some Scripture, but they were not getting the message. They were not getting the truth or understanding it, the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. They had heard the mockery that this was the one who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And that was exactly the truth spoken, of course, in relation to Christ's body. And they had heard the mockery against Him that He is the King of Israel. And they had read the inscription posted above His head which read, Jesus this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And this too was exactly the truth, word for word. And the mockers said he claims to be the Son of God. And that was true as well. These bystanders had heard a lot of words and a lot of truthful words, but they hadn't gotten the point. So what can you call these people? What can you call these people? I think that we can safely call them religious thrill seekers. Religious thrill seekers. Always studying but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Coming to a saving knowledge. Knowing certain things and gathering for religious events and experiences but missing the right idea of who Jesus is. Can it not be said that the churches of the world are filled with such people? That many come looking for a religious experience, be it feeling good, or feeling bad, or feeling different. But in the end of the day, it's not our feelings that are critical. It's the truth about Jesus Christ that is critical. You might have all the feelings that you want, but if you don't accept the truth of who Jesus is and what He came to do, those feelings will do you no good. These people came thinking that they would see a great show. They came thinking that maybe Elijah would show up. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be something to tell a friend? They stood at the center of history, at the foot of the cross, but they missed the point that the Son of God was dying to save sinners. 
And what did they think that Jesus needed? Well, one of them ran to go get a sponge and put some wine on it and put it on the end of a stick, held it up to Jesus. And this is the second time that Jesus is offered wine in this chapter. You can see that already in verse 34, the first time. He's offered wine just before he's crucified, and now he's offered wine again just before he dies. And commentators seem to be divided on this one as to the the purpose of the wine. Some think that this was an act of kindness. An act of kindness in order to to dull or alleviate Christ's suffering somewhat. And others think it was further mockery and cruelty for giving him this sour wine would have only made him more thirsty and, and increased his level of suffering. Well, it's the latter interpretation that is more likely the right interpretation. For this seems to to fulfill the prophecy we find in Psalm, Psalm 69, verse 21. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. It wasn't kindness, it was cruelty. Maybe these bystanders were thinking, that if they gave him some wine, they would have a little more time to buy, to see if Elijah shows up. They were there for the spectacle, after all. They would hate for it to be over too soon. Let's see if Elijah comes. We're curious. We're on the edge of our seats. We're fascinated. But did Jesus need Elijah? No, he didn't. For him, the prophecy of Elijah had already been fulfilled. Elijah had come to prepare the way for him and to comfort him in his distress. There would be no more help for him from Elijah. So then those standing around, they say, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. But is Jesus to be saved? Here again, the bystanders show their ignorance. That they don't know anything about true religion. They think that there is nothing more than physical life in this world, here and now. And therefore, if Christ is dying on the cross, the number one thing that he must wish for is that he might come down from the cross and that he might live. They can't imagine that that is not what Jesus is wishing for, hoping for, or accomplishing. They don't know anything about his priorities, about his goals, or his work, or the meaning of his life, because they don't know what Jesus was there to do. So what was Jesus there to do? To these bystanders, this was just a place where he would die. That's all they saw. There was a crucifixion. There was some commotion. Then he died. That happens to everybody. Nothing special. Get over it. Move on with your life. They no doubt went home and didn't think much more about it. As far as they were concerned, what had Jesus done? The answer was nothing. But of course, by faith, we know that on the cross, Jesus Christ did everything. He did not come down from the cross because he did not come to save himself, but to save others. He did not come down from the cross through the help of Elijah because Elijah couldn't do it. And he didn't come down from the cross through the help of the Father because the Father wouldn't do it. Because it was the Father's purpose and will that he hung there and that he die. And though Jesus himself had the power to come down off the cross, he didn't use his power to do that because he was there to carry out the Father's will to the end to fulfill every promise of God to deal with the sin of this world. So it is by the eye of faith that we see Jesus there 
as the seed of the woman being struck on the heel. He was the holy temple of God being destroyed so that when he was rebuilt again in three days, he would be able to give life and forgiveness to his people. On the cross, he would finish everything necessary for the redemption of his people. He saved others, but himself he couldn't save. We see that in our text, don't we, that he saved others. The faithful saints, for instance, who were there with him, those women watching, though not entirely understanding it all, and and no doubt filled with deep grief and sorrow, yet they trusted in him. He died to save them. And then there's the detail that Matthew mentions of the tombs breaking open following our text, and the bodies of many holy people who had died and were buried were raised to life and came out of their tombs and appeared to many people. How remarkable. Christ died for them to save those saints who had already died. And he died to save some of those Roman soldiers, those hardened and indifferent ones who were there to do their job, the centurion and those who were with him, who had seen the darkness and the other things that were happening, the things that Christ said. They heard his cries. They felt the earthquake. And they responded by saying, Surely, He was the Son of God. He saved the women. He saved the saints. And He saved some of the Roman soldiers. But the bystanders, He did not save. They didn't get it. They didn't understand. They didn't care. They were disappointed that there was no good spectacle on that day as they had hoped for. There was no new religious experience to report that day. Their curiosity was not satisfied that day. They were there when they crucified my Lord. But they didn't tremble, tremble, tremble. And so it is so often still the case today. No one comes to church if they are indifferent, unless they are a little child just dragged along by their parents, too young to comprehend what they hear. An indifferent person who has the ability to choose for themselves to come to church or not, won't come to church. And no one comes to church if they hate Jesus either. But there can be people in church, even on Good Friday, who are just religious thrill-seekers like these bystanders. To them, Matthew has written his Gospel to say, Surely, this Jesus was the Son of God. Truly, this death was the center of human history and the only hope of salvation. For sinners, he saved others, but himself he could not save. And so, congregation, we must be sure that we are trusting in him, believing in him, so that the promise of the abundant life of forgiveness and everlasting joy is yours in Jesus Christ, your Savior. So may God grant that that may be the faith of every one of us here today. Amen.
Let us now go to God and give thanks to him in prayer. O Lord, our God, we stand humbled and amazed at the love and the suffering and the depths of agony of our Savior. And we stand amazed, O Lord, that some don't care and some don't get it. So, Lord, we pray that your Spirit may work in this place and in your world so that more and more people may be drawn to see Jesus as he truly is, that many may come to understand the truth and the reality that he is the one who has come to save sinners and the one who gives us abundant life. So, Lord, fill our hearts with awe and wonder so that we may recognize and believe that the death of Jesus Christ in our place is the only sure and solid ground for our hope and salvation. So, Father, work in each of us a living and joyful faith in you. Father, we pray that the good news of the cross may continue to spread throughout our world today. And Father, we pray now also for those in this world who are living apart from you, who remain separated from you because of their sin, because of their unwillingness to repent. Father, we pray that you will so work in their hearts to remove their ignorance and blindness and unbelief that stands in the way of them coming to you. Lord, we pray that you will bring them to you. We pray that they may find their only comfort and hope in life and in death in Jesus Christ. We pray for those who have never heard the truth of the gospel. Cause your truth to reach them and and open their minds so that they may understand it and that they may be brought to faith. And we pray for those who have lost their faith, who have become hardened in their ways, who who are simply not concerned and not interested with the eternal state and well-being of their souls. We also pray for those who scorn the message of the cross, who attempt to silence the gospel from being proclaimed and who attack those who bring your word or who believe it. We pray that you will turn their hearts around so that they will not continue down the path that leads to destruction and death, but that they may find in Christ the only road that leads to eternal life through forgiveness and through grace. So, Father, we pray that you will bless us for the further part of this day in whatever we do. May it be a most wonderful day for us, a day to rest and remember and rejoice, a day to have fellowship, a day in which we may focus our attention upon what Christ has done for us to bring us into a restored relationship with you. So, Lord, hear our prayer and accept the thank offerings we bring, for we offer it up to you in Christ's name alone. Amen. The Lord now gives you opportunity to bring him your offerings of thankfulness, and after you have brought your gifts, let us sing together from the words of hymn 83, stanzas 1 and 2, in closing hymn 83, all stanzas.
lift up your hearts and receive now the blessing of the Lord and go your ways in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.